Hi, hello there, lovely one. So we're going to be looking at interpreting cubic functions and working through exam type questions, the type of questions you'll see in the exams and things like that. Um, all of these questions are taken from exercise 10 of the grade 12 Mind Action series, the 2019 version. Now, before we read through any of those questions over there, I want you to just take a look at this over here with me. Let's talk about the individual points. For example, well, let's just highlight our axes first. I'm going to highlight the x-axis in blue and the y-axis in blue. And the reason I've done that is because I have this weird little line that's happening over there. So I need to just wrap myself around what's happening. So if this line is over here, then it's probably talking about a tangent. And if I think about it and look at the picture, it looks like A is a tangent to this cubic function at the stationary point. Then I've got some other information. I have C, D, and E, and I can see, ha ha ha, I can see that those are all x-intercepts. So I'm thinking about it. Now let's look over here. F is a y-intercept. That may be useful just now. Then in terms of A and B, those are our stationary points, aren't they? So let's just draw little arrows stationary points. I'm sure you can read what that says. And then we've got this, I don't know, these two points that we're not actually sure why they're useful yet, but we know that they will be. So let's just quickly talk about the kinds of things you're going to be doing during that reading time at the beginning of an exam. And this is a really good example of how to spend those first 10 minutes. If you take a look at the various pictures that you're given, so in this case the graph of a cubic function, and you run your finger over the line. And while you're doing that, you're thinking, okay, there's my x-axis, so my x-intercepts are there, there, and there. And my y-axis, and there, there, and over there. And you do that before you've even read the question. Because now you have an, ex an idea of where the question's going to go. So now that we've done that, let's read through it. The sketch alongside shows the graph of, and there is the function. A and B are stationary points, just like we said they would be. The tangent to the graph at A, well, we spoke about a tangent, cuts the graph again at P. And there it is. M is a point on F. Okay, first question, calculate the coordinates of C, D, and E. Now, because we went through it just now, uh, we know already that our coordinates of C, D, and E, they are our x-intercepts. And in order to find the x-intercept, what do we need to do? We make y equal to zero. So I'm just quickly writing this down again squared minus 8x and then scroll across minus 12. So at this point you're going to use the factor and remainder theorem to try and figure out what fits in there and remember to use your calculator. And that's exactly what I did. I went and substituted a couple of values in on my calculator and I got to the point where I saw that x could have a value of 2. So if x could have a value of 2, it means that my brackets are going to be x minus 2 is equals to 0. So let's put that in over there, x minus 2. And this is where it gets interesting because I know I'm going to have those three terms over here. The first term is easy because what times x will give me x cubed. That's going to give me x squared. And what times negative 2 will give me negative 12. And that's positive 6. This middle term is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, I have the values in the first bracket of x and negative 2. I've got to multiply them both by something so that when we add the products of those particular things, let's say we're going to get an answer of 5x squared. Okay, we can do the negative 8x, but well, I made an executive decision at this point. Now, when I say I'm going to multiply by two different things, I know that it's going to, one of those things are going to either be x squared or plus 6. Now I'm looking to get an answer of 5x squared, so that means I must be multiplying 2, negative 2x by x squared, because that will give me negative 2x squared. And that is important because now I know that something plus negative 2x squared will give me negative, well, give me positive 5x squared. So that means it's got to be 7x squared. What do I multiply x by to get to 7x squared? It is 7x, so that's how I get to my middle term over there. Now it's a matter of doing the trinomial, so I'm going to erase all of this and pretend that I was clever and could do it immediately without any assistance. Um, and we've got x minus 2, 
we know that we're going to get, sorry, the trinomial over there, the first term will be x and x, and the last terms will be 6 and 1 is equals to 0, so that means x is 2, or it's negative 6, or it's negative 1. So yes, we've done some great maths and we've got some answers, but we need to be careful over here because the question asks us to find the coordinates of C, D, and E. They don't want the measurements or that X is equals to or anything like that. They want us to say that coordinate C has a value of negative 6 and 0. Coordinate D has a value of negative, let's see what it was, it was negative 1 and 0, and E has a coordinate of 2 and 0. That's where your marks are going to come from, so it's very important that you do that final step. What I can hear you asking is how do I know that C is the negative 6 and 0? I look at the values of x and I look at our number line over there. C is the one that is the, well I don't know, the furthest away from 0 on the negative side, so that means it must be negative 6. D is between E and C, so it must be negative 1 and so on and so forth. In terms of mark allocation for this particular question, I would estimate it's at about 5, depending on what they're wanting to test you on. It would be one mark for each of those coordinates, and then there would be a mark allocated to factor and remainder theorem, and then to doing the trinomial as well. But that's, you know, my thoughts on the matter. Sometimes I give a little bit less, and sometimes a little bit more. Question 2 says write down the coordinates of f. It feels like this should have been question 1, because it's easier f is our y-intercept, and we can see over there that our y-intercept is at negative 12. So when you write down your answer, please remember they're looking for coordinates, so you must write down that it's 0 and negative 12. The next question, calculate the coordinates of a and b. We spoke about a and b being stationary points. So let's just write off, off to the side, we're doing question 3, and in order to find stationary points, we then need to find the first derivative. Of course, that's going to be 3x squared plus 10x minus 8. And at stationary points, our first derivative is equals to 0, and then we would solve by factorizing. So now that I've found the value for x at those two stationary points, I then need to substitute it back into the original function to find the corresponding y-coordinate for each of those. And that's what I've done. I've substituted it into the function and I've found the coordinate. B is going to be at the two thirds and A will be where x is equals to negative four. So I've got a really complicated answer over there and that's why I put it in decimal form because it gives a better idea of where B actually is. You don't need to show these calculations over here. You can do them directly into your calculator. However, I do recommend that you do them because if something goes wrong and you get the wrong answer here, at least you could possibly get marks for this. Once again, remember that they're asking for the coordinates, so you do need to say that B is going to be that much and A is going to be that much over there. As we're going along, you'll see that I've been filling in the information onto the diagram. Remember, your exam paper is your exam paper. You could draw hearts and flowers all over it if you wanted to. Don't recommend it. It is a waste of time. But the point is, you are allowed to draw on these diagrams and highlight and all sorts of things like that. So the next question, for which values of x is f decreasing? Let's use my f fabulous highlighter. I'm looking for where our function is going down. So it's going down over there. Let's just join that up. And that is between, and I like to do this first before I write down anything. I know that it's going to be between a and b. So I write that down because then I can remember that at a, <laughs> sorry, my mistake, at a, x is not 36, x is negative 4, and at b, and I go and look at b, and I see that x is 2 over 3. The reason I've included those two numbers is because at a stationary point, the function is both going up and going down. So that is included in that Thing over there in that inequality. Next we're asked to find the, calculate the coordinate of the point of inflection of f and of course we know that in order to calculate the point of inflection we need to find the second derivative of any function. 
it helps, of course, for me to see what the first derivative is. So I'm quickly going to write it down again. 3x squared plus 10x, and it was minus 8. So that means our second derivative is going to be 6x plus 10. Now, at the point of inflection, our second derivative is equals to 0, and that allows us to calculate the value for x at that point, and x is going to be negative 5 over 3. If the question had asked us to find the coordinates, in other words, the full x and y value, for the point of inflection, we would have then substituted that value back into the function. But it's only asking for the x-coordinate of the point of inflection, and that's why we can leave it like that. The next question asks us to calculate the coordinate of p. I have a tendency to overthink questions like this, because then my first reaction was I need to find the equation of this line, and then I can do a simultaneous equation, all sorts of things like that. But once I think about it just a little bit more, I realize that we know what the y value for p is. The y value is going to be 36. So I've got the value of the function. Let's just write it down. I know that our y value is 36. All I need to do then is to solve which is exactly what I've done. So I went through and I found, using the factor and remainder theorem, I found that x could be 3, um, which I then factorized and afterwards did that. After thinking about it for a little while, I realized I was a bit silly because I knew that x could also be negative 4. So instead of trying to punch a whole lot of numbers into a calculator and do guesswork, I could have first taken out x plus 4 as a common factor. But I still get to the same place where p has a value of 3 and 36. These questions do get a little long, but if you're still with me, that's fabulous. Well done. Um, getting to the end, though, this last or second last question says determine the equation of the tangent to f at m. Now, finally, we're using that over there. Remember that when we're talking about a tangent to a function, we're looking at the first derivative. So let's just write it down again. And then... Because I've got the value of x at m, which is negative 5, I substitute it into that, and that means I've got the gradient for that particular line. The only other thing I need now in order to calculate anything is a point. I am given a point of m is negative 5 in q. I need to figure out what that y value is, and the way I'm going to do that is go to the original function and substitute in negative 5 to find out what the y value is. Remember, you do have a calculator, you should use it to do this. I ran out of space a little bit, so it's crammed up over there, but when I put it into my calculator, I get an answer of 28, and now I have the gradient and I have a point. All I need to do is some magic substitution. I know the equation of the line is y equals mx plus c. My gradient is 17. I'm going to substitute the point in and then solve for c. So I have solved for C, I got 113, and then I would substitute it back into the formula to get my equation. The other way to do it is to use this formula. To be honest, I keep forgetting about it. I like this, this is my comfort zone. But this works out quite quickly. I substitute the value of the y, which was 28, and of the x, which was negative 5, and I put in the gradient, multiply out and rearrange, and I get the formula of the line. And the last bit of the question, let's look at it. For which values is f of x less than 0? Let's actually change that to blue. I just like blue better for this particular thing. So we're looking for where it's less than 0, which means that it is underneath that x-axis. But once again, what I like to do, before I write down any values or anything like that, I'm going to write down that x should be over there and it should be over there. And it's between point C and all of those things. Actually, this is looking a little messy, so let me just write it over here. X is going to be before C. And it's going to be between D and E. And the reason that helps me is because now I'm not trying to look at just values over there. I'm, giving, I'm getting more of an idea of what's happening. Once I've done that, I can fill in the values for x at those points. So x is less than or equal to negative 6, and it goes d has a value of x is equals to negative 1, and e has a value of 2. Now the reason I put the line underneath is because the question is telling me that as well. This next question is such a good exam question, because now it's testing your understanding of the derivative. Now it's asking where the derivative 
is less, or oh, sorry, more than zero. We know that the function of the derivative is going to be a parabola. Sorry, getting distracted as I write this down. So let's just write it down properly. It's going to be plus 10x and it was minus 8. Now that parabola has an upright shape and those two points over there and over there we know are going to represent the same x values as our stationary points. So um, that should be at negative 4 then and it will be at 2 over 3 because we've studied this, we know that. Our stationary points A is at negative 4, there it is and b is at 2 over 3, they're asking for which values it's going to be more than 0, so let's get out that highlighter. We're looking at where it's above the x-axis, so let's shift this over just a little bit, and that means that x is going to be less than negative 4, or it's going to be more than 2 over 3. I'm not going to lie, this last one is a little intimidating, so, uh, well, we'll do what we can, won't we? You'll see that as I'm talking, I'm just busy drawing in the derivative graph, it'll be something like that. It's not accurate, please don't think I've done it accurately. Okay, there it is. What I do know is that that is negative 4, and that over there is 2 over 3. The reason why this is necessary is they're asking where does, well, when f of x is multiplied by its derivative, where is it more than zero? And there are a number of ways to do this. I'm going to show you my favorite way because it's a way of managing my stress. I don't know. So over here, my cubic function is positive and positive, and then it's positive over here. So I'm going to use my highlighter to show that my cubic function are positive there and there and it's positive over there. Then I'm also going to use that same highlighter to show where my derivative is positive. And the reason that's useful is because now I can see where they match up. So I'm wanting to see where both functions are positive and they are both positive between this spot over here. So they're both above the x-axis there. And then, where they're both positive again, well, it's actually only from here again, onwards, forever and ever and ever. And that would tell us that those two functions are positive there. So let's just pull that in before I say too much other stuff. It's going to be between negative 6 and negative 1. And it's also going to be after 2. But hold on a second. We also know that like positive times positive is a positive, a negative times a negative also works out. So now let's see if a yellow highlighter will work. Here's where this is negative, and I'm looking for the cubic function where that is negative as well. And the only place they are both negative at the same time is between D and B. So the other place it could be is between negative 1 and 2 over 3. So this question as it is actually really complicated and for that reason um, it's going to be classified as a difficult question. If you've made it this far I'm really really impressed. I'm going to end off for now. Much love.